and welcome to the latest edition of the Joy Chip Reading Project book discussion. I'm your host, James Edward Mills, and uh, today I'm pleased to introduce my very good friend, uh, Lola Akime uh, Akrastorm. She's my good friend, but I always have difficulty pronouncing her name. <laughs> it's all right. uh, but today we're going to be talking about her book, Due North, a collection of travel observations, reflections, and snapshots across, across colors, cultures, and continents. And I know that we're going to look forward to a great discussion tonight. And again, I'm going to uh, let people into the room as they present themselves. Um, but before we dive into our evening's conversation, um, I'd like to acknowledge first uh, that I'm streaming into you tonight from Washington, D.C., the ancestral homeland of the Anacostians and also the neighboring Pescataway people. Now, I want always to um, acknowledge that wherever you are in North America, to take a moment to recognize the Native people that once called the place you now call and live home. Um, I'd also like to thank the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, for their support on this and other online discussions um, by, hosted by the Deutsche Project, as well as the financial contributions of the Schleck Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society, and the National Park Service, who provide the the funds that we need to pay our speakers each month a small stipend for their time. Um, remember, friends don't let friends work for free. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Deutsche Project, um, I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer. Um, I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and I have a further specialty in outdoor recreation and environmental conservation, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion in the management of public land and natural resources. And I teach an undergraduate course at the Nelson Institute um, called Outdoors for All. And many of the titles that we talk about on the Joy Trip Reading Project are actually on our reading list. And this forum is an opportunity for the general public and non-students to understand a little bit about the importance of the experience of people of color and our relationship with the natural world as shared through memoir and academic research. And my guest tonight, um, Lola um, Ackerstrom, um, is an award-winning visual storyteller, international best-selling author, and travel entrepreneur. And I'm, we're going to get into what a travel entrepreneur is. Um, she has um, reported stories from over 70 countries around the world, and her work has been featured on National Geographic, The New York Times, The Guardian, BBC, CNN, The Travel Channel, Travel and Leisure, Lonely Planet, Forbes, and many, many more. Um, she's also uh, has collaborated on commercial brands such as Dove, Mercedes-Benz, Intrepid, Travel, um, Electrolux, and National Geographic Channel, just to name a few. Um, her book, uh, Due North, um, received the, Loyal, the Lowell Thomas Gold Award for Best Travel Book, and she's also the author of the international best-selling um, and it's uh, pronounced Lagom, uh, The Swedish Welcome. Secret of Living Well. <laughs> Um, and it's available in 18 foreign languages in um, many different editions. And also her best-selling international acclaimed book, In Every Mirror She's Black, is a Good Morning America um, buzz pick, an Amazon editor's pick, and an independent UK best thoughts-provoking story, and was shortlisted for the Bad Form Review Book of the Year. Um, without any ado, um, I'd like to welcome to the discussion uh, my good friend, Lola. Lola, thank you so much for being on the Joy Chip Reading Project. Uh, thank you. The pleasure is mine. And you know, you could have wrapped all of that into just one word or one sentence. She stays busy. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, well, great to be here. Yeah, well, you do indeed stay busy. And um, again, thank you so much for um, sharing your time with us tonight. And um, I've got a couple of prepared questions. And for those folks in the audience who'd like to ask questions as well, um, I will definitely encourage you to um, post your questions in the comments in the in the column to your right. Um, but I'm going to start off with hopefully what is a very simple question. Now, in your bio, you know, you've traveled and reported all over the world. And I can only imagine that your interest in, in travel and travel writing began at a very early age. And I'm kind of curious if you can tell us where your love for travel and exploring began for you. What was your first big foreign country trip? Absolutely. So uh, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, you know, up until I was 15. And I grew up in a, fam in a traveling family, right? So my grandfather was in the shipping business, so he traveled a lot. 
And uh, I also found that that my grandfather had been to Greenland in the 70s, so already intrepid. And then um, my dad uh, is a geologist or retired as a geologist, and he traveled all over the world. So in a sense, that sense of experiencing beyond borders, beyond boundaries, was already instilled in me at a very young age. Um, my first trip abroad was before I was one years old, you know, and so in a sense, travel was a natural lifestyle. You know, it wasn't this kind of novelty for us. It was just part of uh, finding my place in the bigger scheme of the world, right? And so, you know, traveled a lot to, uh, in my when I was younger, and then when I moved to the U.S. at 15, that was when I moved to go start college, moved on my own. And that was when I realized um, I love telling stories. There has to be a way of experiencing the world as an African, as a Black African woman, and sharing that, you know, my my lens of the world with others, you know. And so that's kind of how those seeds kind of came about, Leon. So where was that first trip? Do you do you recall or do you have, have photographs of what it was like for you when you were a child traveling? Oh, like I mean, we have so many uh, photographs from uh, because my dad worked for an Italian company. So we traveled to Italy a lot, uh, to the UK. So we've got lots of these little, you know, pictures of, of uh, when I was young in lots of different places. But I think the one trip that actually set me on this course to being a travel writer was actually in 2002. And at that time I was already working as a programmer in you know, nine to five career. And I found uh, this ad in the newspaper back then. So no ads online, it was in the newspaper, looking for volunteers to volunteer with an adventure expedition race in Fiji. And that expedition was called the Eco Challenge. And it was created by the, the same producers that created Survivor, you know, on TV in the US. And so I applied for it. And that was one of the most incredible moments of my life. We spent three weeks in Fiji following all these athletes. So these are people that are tired of triathlons and need that next challenge, right? right. So our job was to kind of follow them around and write stories every day for the website and, and dis, uh, share dispatches from the field with the rest of the world. And so that was my first foray into actually writing, writing about place and experiences, about the different villages we were traversing in Fiji, you know, uh, the culture, interviewing the athletes. And that it was that moment that I realized this is what I really want to do. I really want to be able to share this view, my view, how I'm experiencing the world uh, with with others through stories and also visually. Well, that's something that I didn't know. I'm, I've always been a big fan of Eco Challenge, and I know that they just recently re-inspired the world's toughest race, which is kind yes. of the next step after Eco Challenge. And yes. it was just this past year that they had the very first team of Black athletes. And yeah. that was actually something that took a very long time to to come about. Very early on in, in your career working on Eco Challenge, what was your experience with the athletes and the people that you were covering at the time? Was that something that got you thinking about, I guess, a different worldview that focuses perhaps on um, an ethnic experience that might be different than what we typically see in newspapers and television and in magazines? Correct. So I think one of the things that I was one of, I think I was probably like the only Black volunteer, like Black woman volunteer. So it was back then, you know, where it was still very, where the word adventure was tied to like a white man, right? And so being in, in there was also getting behind the scenes and seeing how the athletes were also interacting as well as respecting the places they were traveling through, right? Because some of the times, you know, we feel like people come in and are just disrespectful or come in with their own view. But I think one thing we all share as travelers is a certain openness, I would hope, 
you know, openness as well as the that willingness to learn from others to organically respect because we are traveling to new lands, new, you know, to our people, people's backyards in a sense. And so for me, that experience was really life-changing in many ways. One, obviously seeing how a big production works, but also seeing how a big production works in concert with the communities that have given them access to come in and kind of that respect. And, and I think Eco Challenge at that time when I was there really did that. You know, we, it wasn't one that felt very exploit, like went into just exploit and move on. You know, it was really this kind of respectful relationship because we, we spent a lot of time in Fiji running around through villages and making sure that they knew before and that people are going to come through the village or going to pass through. You know, it wasn't just, what, who are all these people with mountain bikes, you know, in our... <laughs> <laughs> so yes well that's a big deal because you know i think that you know a lot of western travel to foreign places is exploitive yeah in the sense that you know we go and we bring our equipment and our clothes and our culture and we often avoid or fail to engage with the the, the local community i mean do you feel that as a as a program as an institution that that form of adventure travel is conscious of the importance of cultural integrity in, in, well, in travel? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it's that was in 2000, what, 2002. So yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> exactly, 20 years, 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm, I'm sure it's evolved. You know, I'm sure there are things they could have done better then. But even back then, I was conscious enough to know that it was they were moving in a way that wasn't um, disrespectful at that time anyway. Right. So obviously that's 20 years. There's a lot more uh, evolution since then. Things are probably better. People are learning to use their voices more, you know? And so between now and then, there's definitely been incredible progress, you know? And I think for me, um, I am somebody that's really in tune uh, with mm. energy and with um, values. And so if things don't align right away, I will pick up and I won't be involved, you know, with the project or with, with that. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, I don't know what the tough man race is, how that's organized, but I'm hoping between this kind of 20 year span, things are a lot more inclusive, a lot more diverse. Once you know better, you do better, right? And so that's kind of, uh, my thoughts on that. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I definitely think that your storytelling as a method, you know, does a really good job of helping people to realize that they can do better, you know, by knowing better. And I think that what's interesting too, is that um, a lot of your work is um, a writing style that I think that is very personal. Um, and I think that you share a lot of your own experiences in which you have a profound sense of vulnerability. And I'm curious, I mean, in terms of being able to open yourself to what I can only describe as, you know, emotional risk, you know, or emotional jeopardy, you know, when you, when you travel, how important do you think is it to make yourself vulnerable in especially foreign travel situations in order to have what can might be described as a maximal adventure or travel experience. Absolutely. And I think that is what actually connects us as human beings. When we see that vulnerability in each other, when we see that, you know what, you're also human, you also cry, you also get hurt, you, you make mistakes. And ultimately, what we all share that I've noticed as I've traveled is just we all want to be seen for who we already are. That's it, you know, and everything else builds from that. And so for somebody to be seen for who they already are, it requires them to be honest and open <laughs> and showing who they really are, right? And that comes with vulnerability because especially in a world that's very judgmental, very quick to 
to um, box people or create labels, laying yourself there saying, you know what, this is who I am. I mean, when I was 15 and I moved to the US, I think for many years I was isolated, right? Mm. And when I say isolated, it's because people didn't know what to do with me. I just came in with my own way of moving through the world, with my own tastes, you know, with my own, I love this kind of music, I don't like that. I, I, I played rugby, I played, like I did things that society said I wasn't supposed to do as a black woman. And so in a sense, uh, I always say, once you start living outside of people's boxes for you, then you become impossible to ignore because they're like, who's this person living outside these boundaries? And in a sense, I was actually isolated a lot. And so that is what also informs my travel writing and my photography is what I experienced, that isolation was based off of lack of understanding. If I don't understand you, then I don't need to deal with you because I can't explain what you are, right? And so push aside. And so I bring a lot of that work as well. How about we just pause and really see each other because once we understand each other better, then we will isolate each other less because mm. now, okay, I get it. And so how do we understand each other better? Connecting on what makes us similar, right? Connecting on what we all share, you know, that um, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we all want to feel loved, we want to feel seen, we want to feel protected. You know, if we have kids, we want our kids to feel taken care of. So there are those basic things that if we can connect on that, then we can start making space for our differences as well. Mm. Yeah, I remember there is a, a passage in your book that talks about your green passport book. And yes. that was treated differently than the blue passport books of people around you. Can you tell us about that particular incident and how that experience and others like it might have informed your experience as a traveler? Absolutely. So I am a naturalized American. And before I became a naturalized American, it took me 16 years to get the passport, which meant I traveled a lot on my Nigerian passport, really uh, this forest, beautiful forest green book. And, but because I traveled a lot, I spent a lot of money on visas, which was again, crazy expensive, but also that meant I also had a lot of visas. And so every single time I went through the airport, I was pulled aside. In fact, when I pulled it, I just pulled myself aside, you know, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so because people, those officers didn't want to understand or didn't want to kind of see that, you know what, she may actually be going on vacation because in their world, me, what I represent is usually tied to survival all the time, right? Versus thriving. And so each time I come in with that passport, it's either one, she's, tra she's you know, trafficking drugs or two, She's a prostitute or something in between, right? And so every single time I kept getting pulled aside, I kept getting harassed. And there was, there was a, there's a piece in the, in the book where I talk about my Polish informant where same thing happened in Poland, but it's that, that feeling of always, your motives always questioned, right? right. Always questioned. So. So yeah, I wrote that little ode, you know, to the to the green book, you know, which is my Nigerian passport, but also it represents, you know, a lot of people where, or a lot of countries where the, all these barriers have been put for us to travel freely. I'll give you one uh, quick story. When I was in Uzbekistan, I was taking a lot of selfies with locals because they were just like, oh, you know, black woman, we haven't seen, so I took a lot, fine. But then, I'll, then I started realizing, or actually researching, I realized that uh, the country doesn't really grant visas to Africans, like to African passports, like if you have carrying an African passport, which also made me realize, well, if they are not granting visas to predominantly black countries, then of course, <laughs> there wouldn't be a lot of people traveling 
you know, there on vacation or to experience. And so there will always be, so sometimes there's always that disconnect between what people kind of want to experience versus what's actually legally possible for them to do. And that can add to that, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, if you if you have one of those top 10 passports in the world, cherish it because it makes life uh, a lot easier. And and I will share one more quick story. Um, when this this was a story, and I don't know if I wrote it in the book, but it was on the way towards a, a naturalization ceremony. I think it was for a friend. But on the way out, um, I think we found, I, I met somebody that was asking for money. And I wasn't judging the person, but I was thinking that person doesn't understand the privilege they already have being mm. an American citizen. Where the people where I'd gone to for that naturalization ceremony had spent years before they could get that. So just you know, life is a lot, it's very complex and multi-layered that way, so. Absolutely, and well, here's the interesting thing though, because I mean, I'm a native born American citizen. I have a blue USA passport yes. and I was traveling through Canada and was pulled out for additional scrutiny along with every other person of color on my flight. Yes. Absolutely. I think what makes it more irritating for people that have to pay for the visas to those countries and then get pulled aside, <laughs> because back then the visas were like $300. Like, right. So when I was traveling to Eastern Europe, I'd already spent close to $2,000 in visas alone and then getting pulled aside on top of that. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but you're right. It doesn't, the book doesn't really once once people are ready to discriminate they're going to discriminate you know that's what they're going to see first your color absolutely but that's the the big question then because i think in many incidents and i've been guilty of this myself maybe you've had similar experiences where you just don't want to deal with the hassle so you talk yourself out of going yeah you yeah. know you decide that rather than having to endure the indignity of getting pulled aside, you wind up making plans to avoid that kind of thing. Do you ever find yourself in circumstances where you are encouraging your, yourself or try to be encouraging of others to disregard that apprehension and go anyway? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the world is, even though it doesn't look, <laughs> look that way on TV, the world is actually a lot more good than bad, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I'll give you another story. Uh, one of my worst experiences happened in Luxembourg. And Luxembourg is as Western European as you can get. You know, that's where a lot of banks and companies go register. So it's very, very, I don't know, quote unquote, developed, right? Mm -hmm. But I went into a shop. And the lady was yelling at me. She said, get out of my shop the minute I walked in. And I was like, oh, oh me? Yeah. She's like, yeah, you get out of my shop. I've got windows you can look in from. And I was like, wow. So I walked out of the shop. And that was the first time I'd really cried about an experience. You know, for lack of a better word, I've got pretty thick skin. But this right. time I was crying. I was walking away just crying like, Why? And then I heard somebody yelling, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle. And I turn around and it's a customer from the shop that was running up ill. She's like, ah, Mademoiselle, I just want to apologize. We're not all like that. We're not all like that. I don't know what's wrong with that shopkeeper. We're not all like that. And I always tell that story because, yes, I don't know what was going on with the shop people that day, either she was having a bad day or she was just being racist. But there are also people like the shop customer that came, a random customer that came chasing me. And that's how complex the world is. And so for me to kind of group and say, you know, I'll never go back to Luxembourg because of this one experience right. also negates the fact that there are actually people 
<laughs> with empathy and humanity that kind of balance out. So I would never tell people not to go unless it, if it's a place that's really, really dangerous at the moment, you know, or kind of war torn or something going on. But I would say always go, always go. So one of the things that I really enjoy about your book is that it's divided up in four sections, you know, based on the points of the of the compass, north, south, east, and west. And the title is Due North, but you actually talk about places all over the world. And so I'm really curious to know how you define the direction. So when you describe each point of the world, how do you, what do you consider north? What do you consider right. south? How do you, where, do, where right. does north start? Where does it end? All south, right. east, west, how, how, do you, how do you differentiate? So it actually kind of followed the trajectory of my own life, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of started with South where, you know, I wrote about the Fiji experience, but also about Nigeria, about kind of where I came from, some of our traditions, my culture, and then kind of moved around, you know, to Western Europe, to the East of it, and then kind of moved up North because that's where I'm now based in Sweden in the Nordics. So in a sense, that was kind of how I organized the book in that sense of some of my background, some of my traditions, my culture, and then moving to, you know, Western Europe a little bit, you know, out uh, to Asia and then just coming up to the North. So, so that's, it just kind of follows my own natural trajectory. Well, and I think that it's interesting because it seems that that trajectory not only follows the course of your life, but the globe itself. Mm. And I, I think that it's a it's an interesting way to kind of map out, you know, both time and space. And you live in Stockholm, Sweden now. Yes. And um, um, and uh, you have a blended family um, you know, where you have a um, you have you have small children, you have a husband. How do you manage that life as a as a woman of color with mixed race children making their making your way literally around the world? What is that part of your life as a travel writer like? Absolutely. And I, I have dragged my kids <laughs> to many countries with me. Uh, but what I do is I do keep them very private. So online people actually don't see you know, unless we are really close friends on Facebook, you know, right. you don't see my kids um, because I try to keep to protect them. But also um, living in a place that's predominantly white here in, in Scandinavia and the Nordics and having mixed kids, my role is to show my kids that nobody can box them or tell mm. them anything is not possible. Uh, especially for my daughter, like if people say, well, you can't do this or you're not allowed into this space. I want her to be able to say, oh, really? Well, have you met my mom? Of course, I can do anything I want to do, right? And so in a sense, all I do is for them is to show that the world cannot box them in because the minute they are born, that's what the world, the minute you are born not white, the world is already going to try and create boundaries and limits for you. And in my household, there are no boundaries, there are no limits. And so that is why what I do is, first of all, it's just what I'm passionate about, what I'm called to do. Uh, but then it's also to show them that they can do and be whatever they want with, and nobody can tell them they can't. So is, have there ever been any experiences as a family where you've traveled and had the issues of your mixed race marriage be an, an issue? Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, it's actually one, the one that comes up in <laughs> mind was, uh, this was actually before I had kids. So I was traveling with my then boyfriend, uh, uh, husband. But um, I think when we were in London, what the hotel, and I think there was an issue or somebody was harassing or calling and, and just harassing us in the room. So we called the staff up to talk to them and they wouldn't even look at me. They just kept talking to, you know, uh, to, to my partner. And he kept saying, but she's the one that's paying. She's the one that reserved. She's the one that she kept. And they're like, 
and they kept and so I get a lot of that where mm. it's uh, almost a dismissive and then they just go straight to him and get his approval or his what, whatever blessing on things. You know, we, we get that a lot. But uh, gratefully, you know, I am quite protective of my kids and mm. I'm also a very, like, when anything, <laughs> I'm quite aggressive when it comes to my kids. So if right. anything, I, I notice anything that's, Untoward, boom, you know, I'm already there, like mama hen, you know, just swollen mm. up. So, uh, but yeah, it's those kind of things where it's more when we travel together, I'm more dismissed and he's, he gets the attention of whoever we're interacting with. So. Yeah. And I would imagine too that with the children that you're raising, you're setting a, an outstanding example for them of how they need to advocate for themselves. And to be the person who will assume authority, assume position, and ultimately be the person who's, who's representing themselves in that set of circumstances. When, and, and I know that that's one of the things that you do either directly or indirectly in your writing. I mean, you yeah. definitely advocate for a certain amount of courage. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and, I, and it depends, also depends on context, right? right. Because sometimes... I'm very critical, but I also am critical with solutions. Like I bring, like I'm not um, someone that's just always pointing fingers. This is bad, this is bad. I'm like, okay, everybody breathe. How about you look at things from this angle? Okay, does this make sense? Then why aren't we implementing the solution, right? So, so in a sense, the context matters, you know, and I want to give you an example because I write a lot about Sweden. Mm -hmm. both great and bad right you know and i'm quite critical of sweden but i'm also quite fair in that i extol all its, the great great things about sweden you know i'm a travel writer as well two things can be true <laughs> you know <laughs> and being able to balance those two things can be very tricky yeah and that's actually you know the paradox you know the paradox of you know living in a quote unquote free society and still have profound limitations. And, and I think that that many times, I mean, sometimes those limitations are exclusive to our inability to advocate for ourselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't go places, not because you're not allowed to, but because you don't let yourself go places, do things. And I think that a big part of being able to be a, a, a proficient traveler is to be able to get past that. You know, and again, one of the things that makes your work so interesting and impactful is that you have the ability to let people see themselves. And I think what I love most about your book is the blending of visual images and stories that are place-based, but based on your personal experiences in those places. And as a writer myself, I'm actually curious to know what your process is. I mean, so how do you go about recording your travels abroad? I mean, your your work seems very much like reminiscences, but I'm I'm curious, do you take notes as well as pictures? Do you take yes. visual recordings? I mean, are you taking um, long form interviews? How do you go about crafting the stories that ultimately wind up in your wonderful books? Absolutely. And it's very difficult, especially when you do both, right? So I'm a photographer and a writer. So in a moment, which of the skill am I supposed to prioritize, right? Right. And so what I do is I, I take what I call visual notes. So I'm always mm -hmm. taking photos of kind of everything, names, signs, little things, details, so that those will be the visual uh, details in my story when I write them. And then when I'm talking to somebody, if it's an interview, I just put the, just a little audio on my phone or recorder down mm. so that they talk freely. I rarely take notes that way because that breaks, for me, it breaks the, the, the flow. Like mm -hmm. sometimes, okay, I'm taking the note, I'm taking the note, and then there's that lull while they're waiting for me to, <laughs> to finish scribbling. So I usually don't do that. If I don't have to, it's more just, taking the, the visual notes of the photographs and then just recording the audio and mm -hmm. then transcribing, you know, once back. So that the, so that the 
it feels organic, you know, and they feel relaxed, you know, and they don't feel like they're being interviewed, you know, right. uh, by a journalist. See, and that's really interesting because, you know, you and I have been at this long enough to remember what it was like before the internet yes. <laughs> and before we spent every moment of our waking lives with our phones up yes. and pressing record. And I personally have had um, a real difficult time being the journalist that I've always been in a world where we're constantly being asked to post on Instagram or to um, to send up a, a tweet. Do you struggle as much as I do <laughs> when it comes to being the traveler that you've always been in the modern world of, of internet reporting? I, I think... Um... In the beginning, I thought I struggled, but until I realized I don't have to be uh, everything to everyone mm. and just pick, you know, uh, the platforms that make sense. Uh, and so it, so one of the things I always tell people is I no longer worry about relevance, but I worry more about evolution, right? So, mm. so is my voice evolving? Am I naturally transitioning to the next stage of my life? And is it making sense for that stage of my life? And am I using the right tools at that stage of my life? Because where I am right now, I wish I had more time to play on TikTok. I don't, you know, but I'm picking the tools that make sense right now at this stage, you know, uh, just of my career. And so what I've done, so by having that approach, it's actually lessened the pressure of trying mm. to always post all the time because I only post when when I want to on the channels I want and I don't worry so much about you know the follow accounts or the in that sense I just make sure am I sharing what I really want to share mm. so. wow and I know that you've got a um an international following and yes. People are, are very interested in your particular style of storytelling. And I love that you have your own storytelling learning platform that you call the Geo Traveler Media Academy. Yes. Tell me about that. Absolutely. <laughs> and what, what, is, what is it? I mean, because I, I love how you just describe it as um, you know, a way to help the next generation of travel storytellers get back to the heart get the heart back into the craft. What do you mean by that? And how do you go about doing it? Absolutely. So that statement is to kind of question, let people question themselves. Why do you like to travel? Is it for Instagram? Or is it to challenge yourself? Is it to make yourself vulnerable and learn from others? Like, why? What's your why, right? And so that's what's, the academy tries to help people okay what's your why how can we find your own storytelling voice you know i've got a, a course there that says how to become a, a better storyteller other courses how to sell your photography how to pitch how to find your niche but it's um it's turning the focus from the world back to you so that you can figure out how you want to show up authentically back in the world right mm. and for me um I've been in this for so long, but there's been a certain longevity because I've always been myself. I don't chase trends. And, and I, I look at trends like, uh, like waves in the ocean, right? So a great surfer knows how to surf the trends, <laughs> but doesn't swim in the trends because they know that when they swim, the currents can get them. So what you wanna do is surf the trends, see what part of the trends you can use to guide your brand but don't get consumed by the trend and so that's what I've done for so many years that has allowed me to be able to have a certain longevity in the industry right and mm. so that's the point to the academy is helping people get back to why what's your why what what turns you on why do you like to travel because travel travel itself is not the passion it is the avenue we use to express the passion. So your passion is something that you can do both at home and while you're traveling. Because I always say that if I'm passionate about travel, but then I, I can no longer physically travel, 
Does that mean my life has ended? No. There is something that allowed me to use travel as that avenue that I can still kind of find in my backyard. And I always use examples of like people that say, okay, I love dancing. Like I just love mm. rhythm. Rhythm is my passion. It's something you can do at home as well as traveling. Or, you know, I love to, to, to draw. I love music. It's something you can do both at home and traveling. So find, getting back to that one thing you can do and decoupling it from travel and then <laughs> uh, tacking travel back on. So, so that's kind of what we're doing with the Academy. And next year, we're also launching what I call my photo experiences. Mm -hmm. People have been asking for this for years and I've done this in different parts of the world. But now I'm going to be taking uh, six to eight students to different locations now around the world where we're going to have just really in-depth photography workshops as well as experiencing some amazing places and some amazing tra uh, traditions. So I'm super excited about this. Uh, we've got uh, Mongolia and Croatia right up, you know, right off the bat, and then we've got some other destinations in the works. That sounds amazing. Um, I think I'm going to have to figure out how to get on, on one of those tours. That just sounds remarkable. And and I think more than anything else, it also sounds like you're making it very accessible, you know, so that it is um, something that a person with mi minimal or marginal skills might be able to take advantage of and perhaps learn something from it. You know, and and I love that you said that it's important not to trace chase trends because I it's and I got to tell you personally professionally that's hard to do you know just because you look around and you see what people are looking for or, or what people are doing and how successful they are um how difficult is it not to fall in the trap of giving people what you think they want <laughs> as yeah. opposed to the things that are endemic and true to yourself Correct. that are part of, of your passion and how you deliver it to the world. And, and I think for me personally, it goes back to when I was a teenager where I've just been isolated a lot. So I've always been mm -hmm. doing things, you know, in like my own little silo and not worrying about the world, <laughs> you know, so much. But I think in terms of giving people what they want uh, and it, it asks, so I always say this, right? you have to love people as much as you love yourself. Isn't mm. there in the Bible, right? <laughs> so it's yeah. so not more than yourself, but, but you know, as much as yourself. So if you want to be of service to people, is your art in what you're giving? Like, is your art in that service? Because if it's not, and you just want to give people what they want because you feel like it's going to make money, it, in, you're going to burn out. You're not going to, like what you're doing so it has to be it first of all starts with you what do you really what bonds you what are you passionate about and then finding okay people that are looking for something similar and saying oh you know what this is what i can easily organically offer right and i say this because before i was a, a travel writer and photographer i used to be a consultant a, a programmer working for a consulting company and we used to go to lots of different companies to help fix their problems and, and, and um, you know, provide solutions for them. But the key is when you go to provide a solution for someone, they already have to feel like they own the solution, that they were part of that process. So mm. that once you leave, they take full ownership. They feel like it's their own idea they, that, oh, did we even hire anybody? We just came up with this ourselves. <laughs> That is the job of a consultant to go in, really help, and, and then leave, right? But in this sense, I brought a lot of that mentality into travel, but also because I'm passionate about it, it's, a, it's um, a kind of like an olden, you know, mm. and making sure that it's not just giving people what they want, but is it giving people what they need and will help transform their way of seeing the world and, and showing up better in the world. So it is 15 minutes before the top of the hour, and I want to make sure that we engage our audience. If there's anyone who'd like to ask a question or share something, go ahead and hit the hand raise 
icon in your um, reactions and I'll happily call on you. Um, and I've got one last prepared question and I'm interested in, in one particular aspect of your book. There's a fabulous passage um, that I read that I, I absolutely love. And you wrote, but to me, slow travel has never been about duration. It's about pace. It encourages us to relax and consider why we're traveling. It inspires us to embrace seeing less and going deeper into a culture and how that can enrich and, and transform us much more than skimming its surface. So can I get you to expand upon the notion of what you describe as slow travel? Absolutely. What does that mean? And how, yes. can, it, how can it be achieved? So absolutely. And this kind of came up a piggyback on this old trend of slow food, you know, the slow mm -hmm. food movement that came out of Italy. But slow travel is trying to get us to move in a more conscious way instead of breezing through places that we need to slow down and truly kind of soak up the place, respect the place, learn more. But the problem or the dichotomy was that people kept saying, well, to slow travel, you have to spend a month in a place and move slowly. And then the, and at the same time, this all woofing, you know, where people go stay on farms, all of that came out, up at the, around the same time. And people are like, well, but that's not sustainable. That's not realistic. Unless you live in Europe, you're not getting like four to six weeks vacation to just go sit in one place. And so for me, I wanted to jump into that conversation and say, okay, everybody calm down, time out. Let's be realistic and let's, this has to be inclusive and truly slow travel really has nothing to do with the duration of time you spend, but how fast you move through a place. And so I, I, I told people like, you know what, you can actually slow travel in a day. Mm -hmm. If you just pick one thing, and fully experience that thing in a day. So I always tell people like, okay, if you're a dancer and you wanna go ex experience Paris, well, instead of rushing through all the sites, why not just craft like a really tightly focused dance inspired experience where you go see a show, you go take a lesson, you know, and, and that gets you deeper into the culture through one angle. You don't have to know everything, but it's always better to, to get deeper in one aspect as well into mm. a culture. And so that's my own philosophy around slow travel. I like that. I like that a lot because I think too much or too many of us go places and they we either race through it or we just barely touch the surface on something that we should get infinitely more in depth on. And I think that that, that is excellent, excellent advice. Uh, Vivian Leach, you had um, a question. Um, you raised your hand a moment ago. If you can unmute yourself, and I actually, didn't. I'm going to invite you to unmute, or, or will I, there you go. Um, Vivian, what's your question? Hi, um, thank you so much. This has been super awesome. Uh, my name is Vivian Lucia, and I was just reflecting on a lot of uh, things that um, Lola, you shared, just being from Cameroon and having like issues with visa. And um, I also reflect on how you framed why why traveling. Um, I love your photography, so I come more from that perspective. Um, my two questions were, um, do you feel like as you've gone through uh, this, and I, I'll say I'm, um, I have a totally different daytime job, so... <laughs> Um, this has been really great. But do you feel like you have, um, as you've gone through this, uh, kind of foster or built a community of other um, mentors, like Black women mentors within the field, or perhaps you're the mentor for other people too? Um, and then what advice would you have for um, younger women who are uh, maybe aspiring to venture out to the same field, especially with the reality of having a daytime job that's totally different? Yes, no, absolutely. Great to meet you and great questions. I will start with the second, the daytime job. Before I jumped full time into what I do now, I worked as a programmer for many, many years and I was doing it on the side. So it was my side also. So I didn't quit my job as a programmer until about five to seven years in. Okay. So it's a matter of maybe taking less uh, responsibilities in that day job so that you can free up more time to do your side hustle until you feel like you can make the leap, right? Or you can just one day 
totally up to you. And just in terms of uh, mentorship, you know, uh, I mentor people. I, I, I mentor lots of different uh, photographers as well. I don't know if you've heard of the community Black Women Photographers, but it's just this incredible community made by Polly uh, Irungu. And Polly is so inspiring that she should be my mentor, but I am also a mentor, right? So through the uh, International Women's uh, Media for, uh, Foundation, I am Polly's mentor. And but she has created this incredible community with some uh, amazing partnerships that spotlight Black women photographers around the world. So in a sense, I've created that community, but I am also... Uh, even behind the scenes, I, I mentor as well, in addition to working with different com, uh, organizations and being paired up with mentees. Uh, so I don't know if that answers that question in terms of, of that mentorship, or maybe I, I didn't understand fully. <laughs> No, it does. Yeah, no, it totally does. Yeah, I um, true millennial moment. I follow uh, those two people on Instagram. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah, wonderful. Awesome. I mean, and I think more than anything else, a lot of us assume that we need to do the job that we love full time in order for it to be real. Yeah. <laughs> and and personally, and Lola, you might agree that you know you do the the job that you get paid for to allow you to do the job that you love. Exactly. exactly. And one day, eventually, maybe <laughs> you'll yeah. be able to get paid enough to do the job that you love full time. But oddly enough, I mean, sometimes that full time job suddenly becomes a chore. Yeah. And the job that it was supposed to be your dream job <laughs> is just work at that exactly. point. Exactly. Did, did you ever have um, that experience? I mean, have you ever found that sometimes it, it's hard to do the work that you love because it's how you make your living? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think when it comes to freelancing, you know, because people don't freelance to make money. Like it's not a lot. <laughs> like if you're going to freelance for travel publications, they don't pay a lot. So most of the freelancers actually make their bread and butter, but that would maybe copywriting or working bigger corporate kind of uh, writing jobs and then doing the freelancing just to get the bylines. But just National Geographic, they don't pay that much, but it's the brand that you get, you know, in your portfolio. And so that is what happens. And that's actually why I've reduced my freelancing and only writing pieces I really, really want to write or opinion pieces. Because last, uh, actually earlier this year, I was supposed to write like a what, to, what things to do in Stockholm piece. Mm -hmm. stuff I can write in my sleep not only did it take me two months I even missed the deadline not because I I couldn't write it but because there was something in me that just did not want to write it and that was when I started realizing that it was becoming a chore mm -hmm. and so and that's why I had to readjust what I wanted to write and kind of go back to okay I want to just write opinion pieces or like kind of real uh in-depth kind of travel cultural pieces that aren't top things to do and see and you know so in a sense it can be a chore and that's why you have to almost get back right away start from what you really really love to do because right now the, the field is saturated with people writing top 10 things <laughs> it might be a great way to to break in i mean i did that in the beginning but right now we actually need your voice and what you are interested in right now that's going to make that's going to be unique that you can share and write about right because the top 10 that's that's all the generic stuff so now at this stage you just need people showing up fully with their own voices with their own experiences with the things they really want to already write about right off the bat yeah and it's it's fascinating because yeah as as long as i've known you and um, as as many interactions that we've had, you're just a very interesting person. I have no idea though what you're passionate about because you <laughs> seem to be passionate about so many things. Yeah. Um, you you said earlier that you know when you travel you need to pursue your passions. What are you passionate about? What is it that you look for yeah. when you travel? So if you if you look at all the different things that I do, 
there is one connecting thread and it's cultural connection. Mm -hmm. Every single thing I do, whether I try it in photography, all the different books, whether it's logum, it's about cultural connection, every single thing I do. And so for me, that is my passion. Is my passion is fighting isolation within my sphere of influence. That's, that's, that's my purpose. How can I fight isolation within my sphere of influence? And that's through cultural connection. How can mm. we understand each other better? And so that is what excites me when I travel. When, I, when I'm not traveling, I'm doing the same thing back home, right? So that is the, that is the, the purpose, that is the passion. And then travel is just what I, I look at it as if you think of a stove with four different size burners, your passion is the pot of water. The biggest burner is travel. That's why we go to travel because it cooks it up fastest. Mm -hmm. But if you move it to a smaller burner, it's still going to boil. It's just that it's not going to be as exciting, right? And so that could be maybe real estate. I don't know, you know, a different industry, but that passion is still the same. That part of what I'm still saying. Travel is just what makes it burn faster and, and quicker. So. Well, speaking of burning quickly, I can't believe that we burned through the entire hour of this discussion. <laughs> yes. um, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Lola, thank you so much for sharing your, your time. I know, um, for those of you who don't know, she's in Stockholm, Sweden right now, and it's <laughs> one o'clock in the morning. Almost, almost. 1 a.m. Yes, um, but I where, do want, but there's, there is one person on the call that I want to specifically call out, and it's Anne Becker. Anne, you are incredible. Anne has been an incredible supporter for many years. She has uh, supported our local first startup, which is where we, you know, we do the live video shopping with uh, cultural artisans around the world. Again, cultural connection. So, Anne, you are an incredible person, an incredible soul. And I, I don't know if I tell you this enough, but thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you, too. Thank you. Too. <laughs> well, and and from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for being thank here. And thank you everyone um, for turning out. And truthfully, you know, when we're um, getting to the end of the holiday season, it's well, the, actually the beginning of the holiday season after the first big holiday. It's always difficult to know when and how people will show up. But thank you all um, for bringing your whole and complete selves to this discussion. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined our conversation today. And um, please uh, check out uh, Lola's book, Due North. Um, it's actually available um, through the University of Wisconsin uh, bookstore. Um, and also, um, I want to thank the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also for the financial support of the Schleck Family Foundation, National Geographic, and the National Park Service. Um, I'm looking forward to our next discussion um, in January. Um, we'll be reading the book Nature Swagger by my good friend, Rue Mapp. And I hope that you will add that to your list of readings um, for the new year. And we have other titles coming up um, that will an, include um, the book, um, Kosher Soul by um, um, by Michael Twitty and, and other fabulous titles on the Joy Trip Reading Project. Everyone, thank you very much for coming and um, we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank, thank, thank you, you and have a great thank evening. You, thank, Good night, you. Everyone. thank you, Vivian. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, James.